Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the next webinar in our webinar series with the Sclera Lens Education Society. So tonight's lecture is on ocular surface disease rehabilitation with sclera lenses, fitting, and troubleshooting. We have two awesome speakers tonight. First, we have Dr. Kelsey Skidmore, who graduated from the University of Houston College of Optometry with an ODMS degree. And her master's thesis was actually centered around sclera lens complications. So this is definitely her in her wheelhouse. Um, she now currently practices at an ODMD practice and surgical center with a focus on specialty contact lenses for irregular corneas and ocular surface disease, as well as myopia management in children. Dr. Skidmore is also currently adjunct faculty at the University of Houston College of Optometry, where she participates in research projects with the Ocular Surface Institute. And these projects involve a variety of things, including ocular surface disease, contact lenses, and myopia management. Dr. Skidmore is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, as well as a fellow of the Sclera Lens Education Society, where she is actively involved with the Public Education Committee. She is also a member of the AOA, the TOA, and the HCOS. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we also have with us tonight, Dr. Monbeen Betty, she graduated with her doctorate of optometry from the Illinois College of Optometry. During her time there, she was actually awarded several different great awards. One is she was a member of the BSK Honor Society, the Tooman Key Honor Society, and she's a lifelong member of the Gold Key International Optometric Honor Society based on her leadership efforts and her academic performance. After graduating, she went on to complete a residency in cornea and contact lenses at the Southern California College of Optometry, Marshall B. Ketchum University, where she focused on specialty contact lenses, con specialty contact lens fitting for corneal pathologies, aphakia, and prosthetics. So she's been working with specialty lenses for a while. So we're very excited to have her as well. She has lectured at a variety of local optometric societies and universities, and she's even written articles for contact lens spectrum and has presented at several international meetings. She's a fellow of the Sclera Lens Education Society, as well as a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. So thank you guys both for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Mati. We're excited to be here. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. Perfect. All right. I guess we can get going, Dr. Betty. Um, for financial disclosures, um, I've done some research in the past with Alcon, Novartis, and Euclid. And then for Dr. Betty, nothing to disclose. All right. So this lecture will be going into not just fitting scleral lenses, but mostly going into the ocular surface disease that you're actually fitting. So we're gonna understand the underlying diseases that can be managed with scleral lenses, uh, navigate a few different hurdles that can potentially occur when you're fitting and then after the fitting process, and then go into some case discussion. Uh, so going on to the next slide, most of this we already know. We're looking through the workings of a scleral lens. Scleral lenses, they have the tear reservoir. You want to vault over the cornea and the limbus, align the edges nicely with the conjunctiva. We break the zone down into three major categories. You look at the optic zone, which is that central zone. Given the optical effect, contains the optics, vaults over the central cornea. As we go out towards the limbus, also called the transitional zone, this is something that also can help control the sagittal depth depending on the lens design. But in some designs, you can actually adjust that limbal clearance, which can be really important with some of these disease corneas. And then of course, the area that is involved with the most comfort of the lens will be that haptic or the scleral landing zone. This is a set of several peripheral curves aiming to vault over the limbus and then land softly and evenly on the conjunctiva. Many of us know these advantages of scleral lenses. They bathe the cornea in fluid throughout wear, um, allowing the ocular surface to be protected and help rehabilitate that surface in many of these ocular surface disease. Improving vision is typically what we think about in like your keratoconus patient and regular cornea. And that's a bonus with all of these that we'll be talking about today. But the main issue is protecting the cornea, help rehabilitate it while also enhancing the vision and then comfort. Because this lens, of course, doesn't touch the cornea, 
goes on to the sclera, you are getting super great comfort for that patient throughout the day. For all the indications, the ones on the left are probably the ones that we know the most, in my practice for sure. Um, post-transplants, post rk and keratoconus are probably my top three. Uh, a few corneal scarring, really some PMD patients. But another subset that is really emerging and becoming popular in scleral lens world is scleral lenses for the therapy of ocular surface disease. This can be from just a mild dry eye patient to more moderate. Um, they don't have any underlying major disease. They just have super dry eyes. And to more advanced diseases like Sjogren's, exposure keratopathy, limbal stem cell deficiency, SJS, graft versus hope disease, neurotrophic, um, epithelial defects that just aren't healing. And of course, all the corneal dystrophies. <clears throat> Most of us have been familiar with the DUES 2 report um, back in 2017, I believe, uh, looking at dry eye. That yeah, first sentence there, dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by loss of homeostasis of the tear film. That's really what all these diseases are. They're multifactorial and so is dry eye. So a lot of times we are looking in our wheelhouse throwing multiple treatments at the patient and a lot of times it's gonna be more than one. Uh, they're not gonna do just well with one eye drop or one artificial tear. Uh, punctal plugs don't fix everything. Same thing with scleral lenses. We'll be using a multitude of these treatments together. Uh, to find the best treatment for these dry eye patients. A lot of times that will include scleral lenses, but not limited to. Sometimes it's just going to be your patient that has dry eye. They don't have any disease, but their uh, contact lens failures and everything else. These patients are still great candidates for scleral lenses, even though they might not be what we consider your visually necessary or severe disease. Definitely worth your time to fit, but they do sometimes take a little bit more time commitment, uh, education expectations. You know, lenses are great, but they're um, not actually going to end the disease they have. Just a tool to help manage. <clears throat> Lots of literature has come out the last 15, 20 years supporting scleral lenses as an indication for all these ocular surface diseases. This is one study um, by Dr. Shornack involving about 212 subjects, 346 eyes. This was a retrospective review of medical records along with an analysis survey uh, they sent out to patients later, um, looking into the scleral lens treatment process, evaluating their long-term success over time with scleral lenses as a therapy. So these are all subjects that finished the treatment with it. And they found that you got a great improvement in visual acuity going from the Snellen equivalent about 2040 down to 2025, which is huge for patients. It's taken them from being borderline legal driving to being able to pass their driver's license and feel a lot more comfortable on the road. The most common indications for scleral lenses in this study were just your regular undifferentiated dry eye ocular surface disease exposure keratopathy and neurotrophic keratopathy, but it also included subjects that had Sjogren's, limbal stem cell deficiency, uh, Salzman degeneration, uh, so I can think a couple of chemical injury patients and uh, several other corneal dystrophies. The amount of interventions used prior to scleral lens fitting ranged from zero to eight with an average of three uh, attempted treatments before initiating scleral lens therapy. Before they had therapy, other treatments included artificial tears, punctal occlusion, oral antibiotics, some did soft bandage lenses, amniotic membranes, uh, moisture chamber goggles, lid hygiene, you name it, they've tried it. Um, there wasn't just one treatment that it followed A, B, C, D, E. Everyone had kind of a little bit of a range. The therapeutic goals they're looking for were improved comfort, ocular surface protection, and then resolution of the keratopathy. And this was achieved in all but two subjects, which is pretty impressive. So this just shows that the lenses that are commercially available in our fit sets can be very valuable in treating these severe ocular surface diseases. Diving into more severe than just your dry eye, uh, Sjogren's. So Sjogren's is a a uh, chronic and progressive systemic autoimmune disease that primarily involves the immune medi mediated damage to both your lacrimal and salivary glands. What this translates in clinical symptoms is going to be your dry, out, dry eye and dry mouth, those classic symptoms that we learn about. 
Signs that you'll watch for the slit lamp are going to be your um, corneal erosions. They're going to have a small tear lake volume, usually a reduced tear breakup time, conjunctival hyperemia or other irregularities, my bone gland dysfunction, scarring, or just a few of the signs to watch at the slit lamp. And fairly common with being the second most prevalent autoimmune rheumatic disease. It can be primary, meaning it's just Sjogren's on its own, but also secondary, meaning it has an underlying autoimmune disease, most commonly uh, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or scleroderma. It's important with these patients to be co-managing closely with a rheumatologist. A lot of the time, they're going to be on multiple therapies for all the other systemic issues going on. If they don't have a rheumatologist, I've had this several times where I suspected Sjogren's and then I send off to the rheumatologist. That can be such a great partnership to uh, really manage in the community. <clears throat> Next on our list is going to be exposure care topathy. Um, so this is anything that basically exposes <clears throat> the eyelid. It's not closing properly um, from a cranial nerve seven palsy, lag ophthalmos, proptosis, uh, post-surgical complications. So um, with that cranial nerve palsy, it's you know, more of what we call the Bell's palsy, which is when it's idiopathic. Remember, we also have to roll out when it's not idiopathic, meaning it can be from zoster, infection, trauma, sarcoid, uh, several different things to think about whenever we're figuring out where it came from in the etiology. Symptoms a patient may present with are gonna be your dry eye symptoms, uh, but also again, it's irritation, burning, uh, foreign body sensation, Commonly, the redness is going to be worse in the mornings, and they'll get some pain and light sensitivity. The classic, as you can see in this picture here, is going to be the incomplete blinking. The lid won't be closing all the way, and they're going to get those punctate erosions in the lower one-third of the cornea, or one-half, depending on how closed their eyelid goes. Um, they'll usually have some redness or injection in the region, swelling of the conjunctiva and then conjunctival staining. So be sure to be using both the fluorescein and lysamine green in these patients. Number one treatment, as we will see, is kind of a trend throughout the evening. It's going to be lubrication. Um, so topical lubricating drops, ointment at night, moisture chamber goggles to protect, lid taping, more invasive things like a temporary tarsorophy. But of course, scleral lenses have definitely emerged as an option, which patients typically will go towards uh, before going to some of the surgical options. This next paper, uh, this is in 2007 or 2008, I believe, by Drs. Poulam and Buckley, looking at various indications for scleral lenses. In this case, uh, I pulled from it, I just thought it was really interesting. Uh, it's a case of exposure keratitis due to the inability to close the eyelids following an acoustic neuroma excision. <clears throat> if you're not familiar with acoustic uh, neuromas, they're usually a slow growing tumor. It forms along the branches of the eighth cranial nerve, which of course is next to the seventh or the facial nerve. Uh, the facial nerve can typically be damaged either by the acoustic neuroma itself or as a result of the surgery, which is what happened in this case. It was on excision that they had issues and they had the side effect of not being able to close their eyelid. You can see over on the left, uh, A, it's a very angry eye. You have vascularization over the visual axis, opacification, and then ultimately loss of vision. After six years of wearing the lenses, they have a great follow-up in this. You can see that's a much quieter eye, less hyperemia, and the disease hasn't worsened. It actually improved a little bit. They're not getting further vascularization and improvement of the vision. So these can be life-changing for these patients. <clears throat> uh, next, going into the limbal stem cell deficiency. So our limbal stem cells are generally responsible for maintaining the integrity of the corneal epithelium. They help prevent migration of the conjunctiva epithelial cells onto the cornea. If these are challenged, damaged, destroyed, uh, then the corneal surface might become compromised. And since these cells don't regenerate, the patient's going to have lifelong issues. <clears throat> Several things can cause limbal stem cell deficiency from Stevens-Johnson syndrome, um, OCP, uh, cicatricial pemphigoid, uh, you got some trauma, uh, contact lens wear, neoplasia, the 
first thing we do is try to figure out where it came from to begin with. Patients are typically going to complain of decreased vision, redness, irritation, light sensitivity. And when you're at the slit lamp, you'll typically see that kind of world epithelium pattern from the conjunctivalization where you get this ingrowth of conjunctival epithelium onto the corneal surface. You can get persistent epithelial defects, scarring, uh, corneal vascularization, stromal inflammation. It can be really painful uh, for patients. <clears throat> and basically anything that's causing these limbal stem cells to be damaged can cause this. Treatment is going to be targeted as maximizing the function of the remaining limbal stem cells and the health of the surface. So lubrication like before, top one. Uh, lots of time we'll be used topical steroids, uh, amniotic membranes, autologous serum, and either limbal autograph or allograft, depending on if you have unilateral or bilateral disease. If it's unilateral, you're able to use the fellow eye. If not, you'll have to go elsewhere. Um, but then, of course, scleral lenses have crept in as being a, another tool in our toolbox for treating and managing limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, here's a couple of studies I pulled looking at the treatment of scleral lenses and limbal stem cell deficiency. Both are similar in that they had 27 uh, eyes in the study the, in the show that they had great improvement, which makes sense. Scleral lenses vault over the cornea, bathe the ocular surface in fluid, provide a nice little microenvironment to improve function of those remaining limbal stem cells. In the first study, that top right, looking at the 27 eyes, they found that visual acuity improved in a quarter of patients. It remained stable in half the patients, but in one quarter of the patients, the vision actually decreased a little bit. And in about 44% of patients, their staging actually worsened. So there's three stages when we're talking about limbal stem cell deficiency, depending on how much of the cornea is involved and if it's in the visual axis. And despite therapy, there are several that still worsen just a little bit, which just reminds us these are helping to manage, but we're not reversing a lot of the damage with limbal stem cell deficiency. They found this study that the ones that worsened actually were thinking uh, they thought it might be because of limbal hypoxia. Uh, they recommended that fitting looser, larger lenses might be better to avoid limbal compression and hypoxia. I think they actually did fluorescent angiography and found that that might have been why some of these patients worsen despite treatment. <clears throat> and that was retrospective going down to the bottom left using the pros lens. They also looked at 27 eyes and found that the majority actually had improved vision. 70% of them improved by over two lines, about 16% improved, but just a little bit, just less than two lines. 10%, you know, it halted everything, but didn't improve anything, but only 3% actually had decreased vision. So a little bit better with this study here that, you know, most of them improve vision with this. They didn't find that it helped decrease the level of ocular involvement. Uh, it did help if there were epithelial defects. Those cleared in almost all the subjects that had um, like epithelial defects that were non-healing, but in terms of the stage of the limbal stem cell deficiency, it did not help with that. So overall, looking at these studies, we can take that scleral lenses will improve vision the majority of patients, but you're still going to have a few that are resistant to treatment and a very frequent follow-up is going to be needed to monitor in these cases. Um, so the next condition that we wanted to cover um, is the Steven Johnson syndrome. So normally Steven Johnson syndrome is this disorder of your skin and the mucous membrane. Um, so normally it's triggered with uh, some sort of an adverse drug reaction. Uh, most commonly we notice it with sulfa drugs. It can also ha happen with anti-epilepsy drugs like phenytoin, uh, lamotrigine, as well as allopurinol and NSAIDs. Uh, normally it starts off with more of a um, flu-like symptoms, so fever, malaise, and then it can go into uh, painful blisters across the skin and the mucous membranes. In terms of the eye signs, uh, patients will present with conjunctivitis as well as corneal and conjunctival defects. Uh, there's a lot of changes that can happen to the conjunctival tissue. So there can be scarring, lid anatomy changes can happen, as well as the conjunctival and the corneal defects can also lead into the corneal perforation. Uh, 
As Dr. Skidmore mentioned, a uh, majority of the times, the treatment that we are doing for these patients uh, starts off with lubrication. So again, depending on the severity of the condition, starting off with your gels, ointments can definitely help in rehabilitate the cornea. And then again, as the severity progresses, uh, using autologous serum, steroids, as well as scleral lenses. Um, sometimes, uh, in terms of the surgical treatment, they will also go in at the oral cavity, um, do the mucosal membrane grafts to restore the eye anatomy as well. So when we look at the patients and we look at the severity across Stephen Johnson, so as we followed along the pictures A through D and look in the corneal signs, so initially with the initial presentation, the cornea can have minimal involvement. And then as the disease progresses, there can be extensive neovascularization as well as opacification of the corneal tissue. In terms of the lid anatomy, we can have symblepron. So with this picture, we can see this uh, adhesion between the palpebral conch as well as the bulbar conch, and they can extend into the corneal tissue. As well as we can have shortening of the fornices, um, as well as um, an actual lid change. So entropians can result, and there can be trichiasis with the lid, uh, with the eyelids kind of shaping against the corneal tissue and resulting in epithelial defects. So when we're working with these patients, scleral lenses can be an excellent option in terms of providing constant lubrication to the eye surface, as well as it can actually help in terms of reducing those mechanical and shearing forces of the eyelids against the corneal tissue and can prevent um, further damage to the corneal structure. So this was actually one of the papers that was just recently published in April of 2022. Um, so it was done by Drs. Lee Alaskari and Dr. Karis Kuilo, where they looked at two different patients um, who had SGS, mild and moderate severity, and they were fitted previously in a Boston Pros uh, lens. So Boston Pros lenses are highly customizable contact lenses. Uh, and in this case, these two patients were fitted with back surface channels. So we can see the picture here in C. Um, and then this is how it looks when it's aligned on the conjunctival tissue. So essentially these channels act as this portals for fluid ventilation. So essentially we have more tear exchange that's happening in underneath the corneal, underneath the scleral lens. And the second advantage of having these um, channels is that we are maximizing our oxygen transmission across because we have this constant tear exchange to this compromised eye surface, as well as it allows um, to minimize the suction of the lens on the uh, on the conjunctival tissue with the long-term wear. So when they followed these two patients across 17 months, uh, so this was a patient who had a moderate presentation of SGS. So as they followed this patient along, uh, over here, this was the initial presentation with more dense corneal opacity as well as extensive neovascularization. Uh, across 17 months, there was a reduction in the opacity and the iris became more visible. Uh, over here at the bottom right picture, we can see this strong, robust uh, neovascularization that's kind of running into the corneal tissue. And over 17 months, there was a significant reduction and regression of the neo uh, neovascularization. So similar results have also been noted in the past in different case studies. So this was also another case study by Dr. Gellis. Um, this patient actually had a uh, keratoconus. He was fitted in a corneal GP and had this neovascularization with lipid deposits centrally. And the patient's vision was quite reduced. Uh, it was 20 to 50 uncorrected, 2060 with the corneal RGP. Um, the patient was refitted into a scleral lens and, and followed over the course of three years. So at the three months, uh, along with the scleral lens, the patient also had an extensive regimen of other lubrication drops. He was also on doxycycline and other therapies concurrently to manage the underlying etiology. And he was also using steroids at that time, topical steroids. At the three month, we can see in pictures B and C, there was a reduction in the density of the lipid deposit and the vision improved to 2030. And by the end of three years, there was a very Im impressive reduction in the lipid deposit centrally and regression of neovascularization that was noted in this patient case. So another common disease that we do see is the graft versus host disease. So essentially, this is an immune-mediated response uh, that takes place after stem, stem cell transplantation. So we have this um, cytotoxic T-cell-mediated response against the host antigens. And in case of the eyes, uh, 40 to 60% of these patients do develop some sort of eye-related symptoms. The main targets for GVHD that we see in the eyes are your lacrimal glands as well as your meibomian glands. 
So we have the cytotoxic T, T cell response that goes and targets your periductal lining of the lacrimal gland that can result in permanent stenosis of the gland, of the gland duct, as well as we can have MGD. So just as Dr. Skidmore mentioned, in terms of Sjogren's patients, they have this lacrimal gland involvement. We do see a similar lac lacrimal gland involvement in the GBHD patients, and they can present with severe aqueous deficient dry eyes. So again, in terms of treatments, our primary treatments are to restore the tear volume on that eye with extensive lubrication, punctal plugs. And then scleral lenses can also be a great option in terms of restoring that eye or the corneal surface health. So over here, we can see this is a patient with GVHD. They have dense corneal punctate staining, as well as there are these rolled up filaments that were present on the corneal surface. And with um, hours of scleral lens wear, the corneal surface did appear impressively uh, much improved and the staining did resolve on the patient's eye. Another disease that we commonly see in our clinic is neurotrophic disease. Uh, again, neurotrophic disease is essentially a degenerative disease um, of the trigeminal nerve. And it can happen when there's an insult to the trigeminal nerve anywhere along its path from its nucleus to the corneal nerve endings. It can result, uh, there has been research that has hypothesized that once the trigeminal nerve or the sensory nerve has been damaged, it can change or alter your neuromodulators, and that can affect epithelial cell vitality as well as its metabolism, resulting in these persistent epithelial defects and can cause, if progressed, it can cause tromal melts and corneal perforation. So similar to the other uh, conditions, again, extensive lubrication, punctal plugs, as well as um, amniotic membranes to help with those defects, as well as the corneal health can help in terms of optimizing the eye surface. Uh, in this, these cases, scleral lenses can also be a great option in kind of restoring that ocular eye surface. Uh, so this was a case study that was done by Dr. Gray and colleagues, um, and this was a pediatric patient. So the patient had a history of astrocytoma, uh, gone through debulking surgery. After that, there was some brain cell involvement uh, that happened later down the years, resulting in damage to the cranial nerves. So both the uh, trigeminal as well as facial nerve was involved, resulting in exposure keratopathy as well as a neurotrophic cornea. So initially at presentation, the patient's gone through a multitude of different treatments. Um, they'd had botulinum toxin injections to the levator to induce ptosis. They'd had temporary tarsorphies as well as gold weights added to the lids to induce ptosis um, and a lot of extensive lubrication therapy. Uh, the patient had severe opacity as well as neovascularization that we can see in these top right uh, top left pictures. And then they were uh, and then they were referred to the scleral lens clinic for a fitting. Uh, initially, the patient wore the lenses intermittently, and then they were wearing the lenses for the full time that they were awake, which was eight hours in this case. And at six months, there was a impressive resolution or a decrease in the amount of scarring that they didn't notice. And the vision improved from 1.8 log mark units to roughly about 0.9 log mark units for this patient. Similarly, there has been a lot of studies that have looked at the role of scleral lenses for patients who've had these persistent epithelial defects and who have failed um, the conservative or even surgical management. Uh, so this was a study done, done by Rosen, Paul, and group uh, where they looked at 14 eyes that have these persistent epithelial defects uh, with histories of either SGS, neurotrophic keratitis, or even PKP with uh, epithelial defect uh, that failed the other um, lubrication and other temp, uh, conservative management. So in this case study, the patients were, uh, this was a retrospective case, study, uh, case series where they looked at the patients who were pitted in Boston Pro's lens, uh, which was fluid ventilated, and they were on an overnight or an extended wear modality. Uh, patients wore the lenses for 24 hours and the lenses were only briefly removed in clinic to just clean the lenses and they were reapplied. Uh, they noted that eight of the 14 eyes completely re-epithelialized, and there were only four patients who ended up with microbial keratitis and required PKP surgeries afterwards. Uh, there were a couple of good recommendations that came through from the study, uh, first of which was that they recommended that when we are fitting patients with extended wear schedule who are who have these persistent epithelial defects to uh, wait for a minimum of 24 hours for the corneal defect to heal and for the cornea to be stable before we switch the patients from extended to a daily wear modality. And that would actually that reduce the chances of microbial keratitis. 
Similarly, in another study that was done by Khan and his colleagues, they looked, uh, they had a very similar protocol. They had, they studied eight eyes. It was again, a retrospective case series that they looked at. So in these eight eyes, the patients were fitted with, again, scleral lenses, overnight modality. However, the difference here was that the patients were fitted for at minimum of 72 hours extended wear. And they had different combinations of either autologous serum, of uh, Bigamox, as well as amniotic membrane that was uh, put inside the scleral lens reservoir before the lens was applied. And again, the lens was only removed in clinic briefly for cleaning purposes and then reapplied. And in this, in this case series, they actually noted that the epithelial defect result much faster than what had been noted in the literature prior. And the average time of the epithelial defect resolving was about 11 days. Uh, prior to starting with the scleral lenses, these patients had had these epithelial defect on average for 80 days. And after the scleral lens um, like wear, their defects resolved within 11 days. So one of the uh, things that has been quite controversial has been the overnight scleral lens wear. Again, there is that risk of hypoxic stress that gets induced when the eyes are in a closed eye condition. So the study by Fisher and her colleagues, they looked at um, what kind of edema that, uh, and hypoxic stress the eyes were, um, were facing in the closed eye situation. So they had subjects that had one eye that was fitted in the scleral lens and that was in an open eye state with normal blinking. And the other eye was shut closed for 90 minutes. And they did note that there was stromal edema in the closed eye situation. And there was a positive correlation between the tear, uh, the fluid tear reservoir thickness with the amount of stromal edema that was noted. However, since uh, they didn't know that since it was a theoretical modeling that they did, it, their results were uh, slightly overestimated. When uh, he and the group studied the use of overnight scleral lenses for persistent epithelial defects, they noted that in their case series, all the patients did resolve in terms of healing of the persistent epithelial defect. There wasn't any uh, cases that were reported of microbial keratitis. However, they did uh, warrant caution, especially in patients who had uh, much more compromised cornea, especially patients with a lower endothelial cell count to begin with, to ensure that their eyes are able to support the scleral lens functioning. Uh, similarly, when we talk about scleral lenses, majority of the time we talk about different conditions where we can use scleral lenses. Um, and this paper, this review by Dr. Fidel and Dr. Kramer is excellent, it kind of goes into potential contraindications, specifically patients with low endothelial cell count, and also just maintaining some precaution when we're fitting patients with this overnight scleral lens modality in ensuring that patient education is performed thoroughly. Uh, patient understands the risk and benefits of having the scleral lenses, as well as routine follow-ups to ensure that we are following these patients very carefully when they are on this extended wear modality. Thanks, Dr. Betty. Those are so interesting. I love that lipid keratopathy case. It's just mm -hmm. amazing what a scleral lens can do. Like I like the ones where you can treat them and you actually see a physical difference in the cornea months later. Those are some of the 100%. most interesting cases. <laughs> that had the most impressive result in terms of the uh, decrease in the lipid deposits. Plus it also stressed the point of managing both the scleral lens as well as the dryer component at the same time. Which you are, you're, you're juggling and you're fitting these, which is kind of a segue into this next section that we are still treating the ocular surface and stabilizing the tear film. That's kind of number one uh, to think about. Uh, we'll go into some fitting considerations, uh, different things to think about when it comes to design the lens, materials, treatments, and then the care regimen. There's another uh, little excerpt from the Jews report, just reminding us that scleral lenses are a tool uh, that breaks it down on this table into our initial steps, which are mostly lid hydrine, your warm compresses, uh, lubrication, which if this is the case, especially MGD, then definitely be treating that before first. And then going into things like your um, non-preserved lubrication, they have the moisture chamber goggles, ocular uh, punctual occlusion, steroids. They don't have scleral lenses until that step three. And it isn't really a one size fits all. I know I definitely have done step one for two or three or four for two or whatnot. Um, kind of depends on your patient. So just something to think about here. The biggest thing is we must clearly explain to patients that the scleral lenses aren't actually curing the condition that they're being prescribed for in many cases. 
it's something we, I, you probably get this Dr. Bay too in clinic all the day. Those uh, mm-hmm. diabetic subjects or the hypertensive yes. subjects where they have like 10 medications and that they have mm-hmm. no diseases listed. And I'm like, Oh, this metformin that's, <laughs> a, that's for your diabetes. Oh, like I'm not diabetic anymore. It's gone. I take the, the medicine. I'm like, no, you still have it. This is just controlling it. And I try to explain it's the same things when it comes to scleral lenses, we're just controlling it. This is, no matter if it's some dry eye, your graft versus host, your exposure keratopathy, we're not making it all go away. We're just trying to manage it and get the best vision and comfort uh, throughout the rest of their life. Going into kind of optimizing the fit, of course, central clearance, I typically try to fit um, clearing the cornea and not having to excess clearance. And a lot of these compromised corneas, we want to make sure that we're getting enough oxygen. Same thing at the limbus, uh, usually going for about 50 microns of clearance, give or take a little bit. If you have insufficient clearance, you might get some mechanical irritation versus excessive clearance at the limbus might promote conjunctival prolapse or reduce oxygen transmissibility. Prolapse is definitely one of the more frustrating things to deal with in clinic uh, when it comes to those complications. That's when you have the negative pressure created on the lens. It pulls that conjunctival tissue into the peripheral space between the lens and the cornea. Mild cases, you can monitor a lot of the time, just kind of depends. But if it's severe, you can get adherence of the conjunctival tissue to the underlying cornea that will lead to vascularization scarring. But for these Compromised corneas, especially, they already have that going on. The last thing we need to do is worsen it. Several things to think about when it comes to lens adjustments to try to fix that. Some have thought that excess vault can lead to this. So minimizing the clearance, particularly in that transition or limbal zone, can help decrease the prolapse. Um, sometimes, no matter what we do, you may have the most well-fit lens, um, but you're still having issues. Also think about whenever you're inserting the lens, um, meaning make sure you don't use too much force. I found some patients, especially when they're new, they're so afraid of bubbles. They're just forcing that lens onto the eye. I like to put the lens on their eye myself at some of their follow-ups and ask them, are you using about the same amount of force as me? Do you feel like you're using more or less? And I would say at least half the time, the patient tells me they're using more force than I am. And once they start applying the lens a little bit more gently, a lot of issues, whether it be compression, impingement, or prolapse, that goes away. Um, but sometimes it might be as the patient worsens with age, they have that conjunctival chalasis, it becomes more prominent. And no matter what we do, they still have it. There have been a few cases where I've referred them out for a conjunctival resection procedure, and that can also be pretty helpful. Mm-hmm. Next is picking your diameter. Uh, I found lots of ocular surface disease patients, depending on what we're treating. I'm going with a larger diameter than I would like a keratoconus or a regular um, cornea patient. And picking the right diameter can make all the difference. More coverage, more protection, but more coverage, you also get um, increased touristy of the sclera, which we'll go into a little bit more later. Look at this top picture here. It's our larger diameter lens having a 650 micron depth, 18 millimeter diameter. You can tell here it also has some torque haptics, which I would expect since it's going further out. This is going to be a more of the irregular cornea when you need to vault over that and get a larger seg height. Middle would probably what I call more of our my average lens I start with um, for just the mild irregularity, that 16 diameter, getting about 4,700 micron depth. But for the more little flat corneas, you're going to probably go with smaller depth means smaller diameter, um, particularly some diseases that might cause some scarring. You're going to get some flattening centrally. You're not going to need all that clearance. So going smaller can be super helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, also uh, this patient, uh, the one with the 3,400 microns, sometimes when we have limbal stem cell deficiency, the amount of scarring and the flattening that the patients have, um, it's just, it's a very shallow eye. The eye profile has probably changed at that point. So just going with a smaller lens at that point, it does help. And sometimes just to overcome the conjunctival barriers that the patient might also have in case of a lot of scarring or just lid anatomy changes, um, the 14.8 or a smaller lens might also help in those cases. Super good point. Uh, Next, going into that scleral landing zone, uh, this top right, of course, our beautiful, ideal uh, lid alignment. 
The scleral lens, of course, we want to contour with the scleral shape. We want to avoid impinging or digging into the conjunctiva, as well as avoid lifting off the surface. Symptoms of a tight lens, like you see here in the bottom two images, are going to be your obvious redness. You'll see where the blood vessel will actually get cut off. Patients may notice that this tight lens leaves the imprint on it. They can get kind of a sore sensation. And then on the flip side, looking at that top left, you can see at the bottom of it, you're getting a little edge lift where you see the shadow of the lens there. That's going to cause the lens to move a little bit when they blink. You can get bubbles underneath. The patient's going to feel uncomfortable, like a foreign body sensation, but also can lead to midday fogging because you'll get more oils and proteins that get sucked underneath the lens. And sometimes we can visualize what fit changes are necessary, especially on eyes that have more aligned scleras. But sometimes if the imprint of the lens is difficult to tell, uh, removing the lens, applying fluorescein, and then looking at the areas of compression, it kind of highlights it more. That can be helpful to see areas that have a little bit more impingement. But the more the disease eyes where a larger diameter may be necessary, uh, going to a toric haptic design may be needed and it might be a higher tericity the further out we go. This is when profilometry can be super helpful. Uh, this next slide goes into the scleral shape study. They took, uh, I think it was like eight scans in different meridians and found that the limbal angle, meaning that 10 to 15 millimeter region was fairly consistent and almost symmetric in all eight of those meridians which results in minimal tericity around the limbus. But as we moved out towards that scleral angle, which is more the 15 to 20 millimeter area, it was highly asymmetric with the results in the scleral tericity that increases the further we go from the limbus. So the larger the lens, the more asymmetric the scleral anatomy, you're probably gonna need either a toric or a quadrant specific peripheral curves. This is when you, you can estimate and talk to your lab consultant. I know I do that a lot but going into profilometry where they map out that uh, scleral tericity can be super helpful in predicting that first lens. This can be a lecture all in itself. It is definitely a growing topic, um, but just to cut touch on the few that we have, we have the eaglet, which has a printout looking here on the bottom right, the SMAT 3D image up at the top right, showing the kind of the virtual image of the scleral lens on the eye after being designed. And then the Pentacam is the other option that we have. All righty, I'll let Dr. Betty take over. So a couple of other things when you're designing a scleral lens, uh, especially in patients who have this ocular surface disease. So firstly, when we are working with patients who've had OSDs, uh, their tear film chemistry might be different than that of a patient who had uh, corneal ectasia. They might, they're more prone to having deposits on the lens surface. So picking out different aspects of the lens, such as your wetting angle, coatings, and decay, can be really helpful in the initial stages of designing the lens for the patients. So wetting angle essentially means uh, the ability of this liquid to kind of spread across the surface of the lens. So a lens that has a low wetting angle, just like the one on the top, it means that the liquid is able to spread on the surface much better. So it is a much more wettable lens surface. However, if you're working with a lens that has a higher wetting angle, it means that the drops will kind of beat up on the lens surface. Uh, so the patient will have a lens that, that will have these bunch of different dry spots, and it will be almost like looking through a foggy window and might just uh, deteriorate their vision as well. So this is a, a patient I think that Dr. Skidmore had in her clinic. Uh, when they put the lens on, they noted all these dry spots. So we can actually see the dry spots much better on the optic section here. And there are a lot of different ways to kind of alleviate the wetting issues with the lenses. Firstly, so the labs now as a standard of care, they normally just add the plasma treatment to the lenses when you maybe order the lenses. So plasma treatment is not a coating, it's essentially a cleaning process for the for the scleral lenses. So once the lens has been manufactured, they're put in this chamber with these high energy radio waves in this high oxygen rich environment. So these free oxygen radicals kind of hit against the lens surface and get rid of the protein on all these deposits that the lens might have through the manufacturing process. So a lens that has been treated with a plasma will look something like this at the top. 
picture, uh, sorry, the one that is untreated looks like the top picture, where we can see the liquid kind of beats up on the lens surface. So after the plasma treatment, we'll see that the liquid is able to spread much easier. The lens is more wettable and has a much lower wetting angle. So the ability to, for the fluid to spread is much better. So I think there are a couple of recommendations for the plasma treatment. So initially, like when we or, when we are ordering these lenses, it's important to make sure that we open the vial, especially when the patient's in the clinic and they're ready to dispense. Um, making sure the follow-ups are scheduled pre, like routinely, and so that the lenses are not just sitting in the in the vial. It's important because you don't want the lenses kind of just wearing out um, with the plasma treatment. When we are working with cleaners, um, using cleaners that are not abrasive or don't have those microbeads like your Optimum, like Lobab, or even like the Boston Advance that has those microbeads, uh, that's important because otherwise we'll get rid of the plasma treatment much more quicker. Uh, so a couple of recommended solutions are our Boston Simplest as well as our hydrogen peroxide systems for these lenses. So a coating that we can add on the contact lenses to make the lens more wettable on the eye surface is HydroPack. So it's essentially your polyethylene glycol. It's 90% um, PEG-based polymer that's actually bound to the lens. So when we have a contact lens on the eye, um, on the eye surface, it essentially breaks your tear film down into a pre and a post contact lens tear film. Uh, so with this break of the tear film, it's much more unstable and there's a higher evaporation of the tears across the eye surface. So this hydropack essentially acts as a mucin layer that can hold down the tears and can improve the tear breakup time. So there was this study that was done where they noted that a lens that had the hydropack coating, um, the tear t score or their tear breakup time actually improved to more than 20 seconds. So it just helped with improving the uh, ability of the lens to wet as well as the ability of the lens to be more hydro, um, just attract or bind the tears onto the eye surface. Uh, so this was a patient just uh, with severe MGD and having all these deposits. So in addition to adding the hydropack coating, we also worked on concurrently just managing the dry eyes. So lid hygiene, as well as your heat compresses, omega-3s, so those are very important. And when you are managing these patients to kind of balance uh, with the material, as well as um, addressing that underlying pathology uh, because of which we are seeing all these deposits. Uh, another important component of managing or selecting your lens material is the DK. Again, here we are working with patients who have some sort of severely compromised eye diseases like your Steven Johnson's, limbal stem cell deficiency. So the goal is to maximize that oxygen transmission to the corneal surface. Uh, so back in the day when we worked with PMMA materials, the oxygen permeability was very poor, it was close to zero. But however, now with our silicones and the villus fluorofluorine that has been added to the material with the fluorosilic um, silicone acrylates, we have a good TK value. However, the lenses do attract a lot of deposits as well. So when we are working, it's a, a balance that we're trying to maintain to selecting that low wetting angle to improve that hydrophilicity on the lens surface, make it more lubricious, and at the same time to maximize that oxygen through the eye, through the contact lens surface. So another component of um, working or setting up a clean regimen for these patients is they are using their daily cleaners like their Boston Simplest, hydrogen peroxide systems. Uh, but patients who are these heavy depositors, it's also important to add a stronger cleaning agent such as your Progen. It's a 30 minute treatment that will get rid of all these like uh, more difficult deposits. Uh, so in this picture, in the top picture, we can see we have this white cast all the way in the mid periphery. And then with the 30 minute treatment, there's much better, much more clarity to the lens and these rigid deposits have kind of like gone down. So it's important to add these um, more, much more stronger cleaners in addition with our simplest and as well as the hydrogen process systems that we normally prescribe to patients. Amazing what a good solution cleaner can do. <laughs> uh, same thing with the filling solutions. So of course, we all know that the solutions we fill with have to be preserved or free. But we have a few options. Um, some are buffered, some are non-buffered, some in vials, one in bottle. Uh, Patrick Caroline and Mark Andre did a study actually looking at the effect of the filling solution pH in dry eye patients. Uh, kind of a small case study here where the, I think the patients wore the lenses about 10 hours a day, and they noticed a significant improvement in their dry eye symptoms after using the buffered solutions as compared to the non-buffered solutions. 
looking at signs on the ocular surface, though, there's no difference in the fluorescein or lysamine green staining. So they came to the conclusion here and or suggested that the buffered saline solutions might be a better match of the pH of the human tears and may be more comfortable for the patient over time. <clears throat> when we're looking at solutions, um, buffered versus non-buffered on the next slide, uh, it kind of looks at our options that we have. You have your sclerophyll, uh, the pure lens, and neutrophil on the buffered side, with neutrophil being one of the newer ones that includes the mineral, uh, mineral electrolytes, plus these tear mimicking osmolality and pH, so it has a little bit more natural support. And then looking on the non-buffered side, so pH is less than seven with these. Um, theoretically, you'd want one closer to seven to match the cornea, but I've found in practice, I use all of them. There hasn't really been a one size fits all that I've found. Some patients do better with one versus the other. Some use three different ones. Uh, they use some in their purse, some at work and don't notice much of a difference. It really is so patient dependent. So kind of trial and error and giving the patient options is the best thing to do in my experience. The biggest thing is that follow-ups to remind them to be preservative free. Looking at the next slide, it goes into that a little bit more. This is our classic uh, solution toxicity. I educate so much at follow-ups, at dispense, and it doesn't matter how much sometimes, you'll still get that patient that runs out of their preservative free saline, then run to Walmart or Costco, buy a big O, kind of like half gallon thing of saline, start using it to fill their lenses. I see them a week later and they're like, vision's kind of foggy, my eye feels a little off. Sometimes it's pain, but usually it's kind of like this off sensation or a little foggy. And I start thinking, oh, they're getting some midday fogging. Then I look at the slit lamp and realize, oh, let's take this lens off, stain. And then the cornea is glowing like Christmas. I start asking what they're doing and realize they're using preservatives underneath the lens. Um, you'll also see this sometimes whenever they don't rinse off their cleaning solution. I always tell them, if you can find the filling solution in the store, probably the wrong one. And if it's bigger than that little bottle of pure lens, if it comes in that big half gallon, it's probably the wrong solution too. Anything that doesn't have preservatives is going to be more of in a smaller vial or bottle. Um, but this case, and actually, this is a picture of one of my other patients. I couldn't find the picture of the patient I was going to talk about, but they were actually using the correct solutions. Um, they had changed the type of incense they use in some ceremonies they do at home. And upon questioning, she's like, oh, a week and a half ago, I used a new brand of incense. And like, when did your symptoms start? A week and a half ago. Like, well, we changed her incense type. She went back to normal. So always interrogating the patient to figure out what solutions they're using or if anything changed in their environment is helpful. I will briefly touch on the midday fogging. I know this is probably something we've all have struggled with from time to time, <clears throat> pretty common. You know, they're wonderful to treat, full lenses are wonderful to treat many ocular surface diseases, but they don't do that good with MGD. I feel like I see this a little bit more with MGD patients that drive lipid dysfunction, other causes can maybe poor lens alignment where you're getting it sucked underneath the lens and they need some toric alignment curves. If they have excess clearance. You'll get some lipids and cells in the reservoir. Um, the next study goes into a um, with Dr. Walker, where she did a study looking at patients that have midday fogging versus not, and found there's actually a little higher concentration of these Ig light chain proteins, which had the main tear function in the immune category, then also higher in the nonpolar lipids. Looking over here to the right, they did a grading based on OCT. You can see the MGD patient on the left image OCT, and of course that beautiful clear reservoir on the right. Looking at the study at the bottom, uh, looking at the midday fogging score, you can see that <clears throat> as the midday fogging score increased, meaning you had more dense fogging in the reservoir, you had higher amounts of those fatty amides and wax esters. So you're thinking it's a lot, mostly these sequestered uh, lipids and proteins, sometimes some cell fragments. It varies from patient to patient. Of course, some is going to be makeup, but that's what we're thinking is actually coming underneath the contact. Of course, we want to know what do we do to treat it? Uh, toric peripheral curves can help with better alignment. 
Uh, you can adjust the sagittal height. Um, I try to minimize as much as possible and keep it around 200 or less, depending on what indication I'm treating. Management of the dry eyes, of course, particularly those MGD patients, um, as well as adjusting your filling and cleaning solutions. Um, that can make all the whole world difference. I still use a lot of time like Refresh Cellulisk or an op, uh, Oasis Plus tears. A few drops of that more viscous preservative free tear in the lens and then top it off with whatever preservative free saline they're using. And that's done wonders with some of these patients. No matter what complication you're having, patient education is key, especially when it comes to handling. Make sure to remind them to wash their hands, uh, actually rubbing the lens and rinsing it to provide that better comfort and vision. Uh, always double check at follow-ups that they're doing everything right. Um, tell them to not apply those oil-based moisturizers or any makeup to the eyelid margin. Make sure that any makeup or creams they are applying, they do it after they put the lenses on. And then just the importance of follow-up to monitor the lens condition and ocular health. Um, this is more important with this subset of patients than any, in my opinion. They have severe disease in some cases, so telling them how important it is not to get lost to follow-up is super important, uh, especially those neurotrophic patients that aren't going to really feel it when it goes wrong. Those are the patients I'm going to be following even more constantly, reminding them that we need to be looking at them because they may not know if something's gone haywire. We have just a couple of minutes to go into a few little cases here <clears throat> from our own clinic, of studies. Uh, this was a 67 year old male that was referred to me by their ophthalmologist. They had a recurrent erosion with a persistent epithelial defect. I don't remember the initial cause with them, but they were referred because no matter what they did, they still uh, were not healing. They were on tears, they went on steroids, um, I think cyclosporin, nighttime gels, Procara twice, I believe. Um, they had controlled diabetes and hypertension along with cataract surgery with multifocal IOLs several years prior and we're doing well until they had this erosion. So when they came to me, this is what the poor guy looked like right smack in the middle of his vision. Um, we fit him at the lens. This next shows a little under 300 clearance and about 30 minutes into wear the follow-up at initial presentation vision was about, um, I think the vision was about 2040 to 2050 initial presentation. About a week later, we had already improved to 2030 plus. He was wearing the lenses about eight to 12 hours a day. Um, and then we used lubrication and gels at nighttime. And by the time we reached a month of lens wear, the, on the right, he looked completely clear and he was 2020 and super happy. Um, after it healed, I told him we don't always have to wear it, but he really loved the feeling of it. Uh, I saw him six months later and he even said, now wear it about 50% of the time. He could feel if he's going to have another erosion, if her eyes felt a little dry, he'd go ahead and pop the lens on, start wearing it again for a few days. And then he never actually regressed to having the huge uh, erosion again. He's been doing good ever since. I'll turn over to Dr. Betty now. Um, so this was a patient that actually presented to my clinic when I was doing residency. So it was a 56-year-old female who had been diagnosed with neurotrophic. So in the past, she'd had a history of LASIK. She had EBMD that was diagnosed as well as Salzman's nodular degeneration. Uh, she did develop the neurotrophic component after she had a complicated cataract surgery with a retinal detachment. Uh, so when this patient presented, there was a lot of haze centrally uh, that reduced the visual uh, visual outcome. So she was seeing with glasses 2040, 2050. And then there was the Salzman nodule inferior nasal in the left eye. So the topography was very classic off LASIK, just central flattening as well as careful steeping. This was the right eye and this was the left eye. So this bottom portion that was red and that slightly cut off was where the Salzman nodule was. So when we did the OCT after the initial lens was applied and we waited for about three to four hours for lens settling, uh, there was this chamber, like in the chamber, we can see a lot of debris that was accumulated as well as a significant amount of conjunctival prolapse. So initially, as just Dr. Skidmore mentioned, conjunctival prolapse can be a lot of nuisance. Um, again, because first of all, it does bring in a lot of debris. It does act as a portal to bring debris in 
Plus, at the same time, it acts as an oxygen sink. So it depletes the amount of oxygen that goes to the tissue underneath. So for an already compromised eye with a significant amount of prolapse, it can cause more neovascularization to kind of propagate. So over here, since there was uh, just a lot more clearance that we ideally would want mid peripherally and limbal area, we aligned the lens more. So we brought down the mid peripheral as well as the limbal clearance. Uh, that significantly reduced the conjunctival prolapse. Also, it improved in the midday fogging. Uh, another tip that Dr. Uh, Skidmore mentioned before is actually putting cellulis in the bowl of the lens to increase the viscosity of the tear fluid uh, reservoir also helps in terms of delaying that fogging that happens for these patients. And this was another, uh, another patient that was referred to our contact lens clinic. Uh, this was a 52-year-old woman with a history of stimble, a limbal stem cell failure due to prior soft contact lens overwear. Uh, she'd been managed with lubrication, steroids, as well as doxycycline. She'd had a couple of rounds of that and also had, had an, a round of autologous serum. Uh, she was referred to our clinic. She still had three plus punctate epithelial staining, highly photophobic, and had a very small vertical fissure height. So looking at her topography, uh, just very mild irregularity in the right eye. There was some scarring. The left eye had more scarring, so we just had just more uh, irregularity superiorly there. So when we looked at the profile of the eye, it was very extremely flat. It was a very shallow eye from all the scarring that had happened. Um, so also the, um, the height of the fissure was very restrictive in terms of putting a lens on. So initially when we put the 16 millimeter lens on, it was very, it was very big for her eye. There was a lot of bubbles that were being introduced. So we went with a 14, eight millimeter and the final sagittal height that we finalized was 3,400 um, sagittal height. So quite a flat eye. With about two months of contact lens wear, um, her eye surface did improve. Uh, it went from three plus punctate staining to trace punctate staining. And the patient did notice that she had less photophobia and then she was able to open her eyes even more. Um, so she is one of those patients who wears the lens for eight to 10 hours. And still, like when she takes the lens off, again, she is using your gels and ointments at nighttime and maintaining the dry eye therapy concurrently to just manage the symptoms when the lenses are off. So a couple of important points when we are working with patients with ocular surface disease. So scleral lenses are, have been used for ectasias, PKPs for a long time. Um, using them for patients with ocular surface disease is extremely helpful, especially as we discussed through all these cases. It does provide that microenvironment where the eyes continuously being lubricated. It takes away those shearing forces and the mechanical trauma that the lids can actually cause by the continuous rubbing of the lid against the, uh, the cornea. However, when we are fitting these patients with scleral lenses, it is important to also manage expectations. Uh, scleral lens fitting does not take place on isolation. We are still managing the dry eyes and the underlying pathology that the patients present with. And lastly, just maintaining frequent follow-ups. Even after the fitting is complete, you're still following these patients up for managing eye surface disease, especially as Dr. Skidmore mentioned before, for patients who've had neurotrophic corneas, uh, they, they won't know if the cornea is getting, if they're having an episode of an erosion or if the cornea has another defect, their vision might get affected. However, when we are doing these follow-ups, it's important to kind of take a look underneath the lens and see how the eye itself is doing as well. 